Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Project Truth Beam, and if you are looking for truth, then you have come to the right place. This is a special edition on the Lesser Known Biblical Archaeology, Part 4. I totally recommend watching all the previous videos that lead up to this one, but you do not have to watch those to understand the video today. This video is going to be a resource video in which you are going to see many of the biblical characters that are mentioned that scholars say did not exist, but then we find archeological evidence and or manuscripts that mention their names. And so I am going to present those to you in this video. Archeologists find evidence that the Bible is correct almost on a daily basis, but the academic world, which has an agenda, would like you to believe that the Bible is not true or not correct. The format in which we will share in this video will be that I will read the biblical verses mentioning the person, and then I will show you outside sources showing that this person was a true and real person. Now let's discuss Ahab, king of Israel. 1 Kings 16, verse 29 through 30. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king of Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. This was a common theme of the kings of Israel. A stele discovered near the town of Kurik in Turkey, as you can see on the left, in which it's talking about a battle. And it describes 2,000 chariots, 10,000 soldiers of Ahab of Israel. And this is the Battle of Karkar, and that dates to 852 to 853 BC. Now let's discuss Ahaz, king of Judah. 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Rimala, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what is right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. If you look to your left, this is the slab that was found in Assyria. And it is called the Assyrian Inscription, Summary Inscription 7, describing kings and cities paying tribute to Assyrian king Tagalf Pileser III. And this dates to 735 to 715 BC. And the inscription reads I have received tribute of Hiram, the Tyrian, Pisirius, the Karchishamite. Maitenti, the Ashkelonite, Jehoahaz, Judahite, Kwas Malaka, the Edomite, and Hanunu, the Gazian. Gold, silver, tin, multicolored garments, red, purple, wool, royal treasures. And here you have Ahaz being mentioned. Now let's go on to Ben Hadad, son of Hazael, king of Assyria. 2 Kings 13, verse 24 through 25. Now Hezael, king of Assyria, died. Ben Ben Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And Jehoahaz, son of Jehoaz, recaptured from the hand of Ben Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoaz his father by war. Three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. Just a quick note on Ben Hadad. Hadad is a Canaanite god. and Ben means son of. This delay to the left dates to 806 BC. It's a basalt stele discovered in Syria called the inscription of Zakor. This is what is inscribed on the monument. The monument which Zakor, king of Hamath, 
set up for Elwer, a weather god. The Bar Hadad, son Hazael, king of Aram, united against me seventeen kings. Now let's look at Hazael, king of Assyria. Second Kings chapter eight, verse seven through fifteen. Ben Hadad, king of Syria, was sick. King said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand and go and meet with the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. He died and Hazael reigned in his place. If you look to the left, you will see the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, in which it states, In the 18th year of my reign, I crossed the Euphrates for the 16th time. Hazael of Damascus attacked for battle. I took 1,121 of his chariots, 470 of his riding horses, Together with his camp, in the 21st year of my reign, I crossed the Euphrates for the 21st time. I marched to the cities of Hazael of Damascus. I captured four of his centers. Here we have archaeological evidence proving that the king of Syria was Hazael. Continuing on with the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, if you look to the left, you can see at the bottom, Jehu is bowing to Shalmaneser. Jehu is king of Israel. In the Bible, we have 2 Kings 10, verse 28 through 36. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin that is from the golden calves that they were at bethel and dan on a side note the remains of the altar at dan where they worshiped the golden calf are still there to this day continuing on and it says and the lord said to jehu because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight I have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart. Your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. So Jehu rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And the period that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. And this time period would be dating to 843 or 842 B.C. On the obelisk where it describes Jehu, it states, I received the tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, silver, gold, a golden bowl, a gold vase, and then there's a questionable word that we don't know, gold goblets, gold buckets, tin, and royal scepters and javelins. It's also important to note that the Bible describes of Omri, and of course, Omri is described on this obelisk. Now let's go on to Jehukal and his father, Shelemiah. In the Bible, we have Jeremiah 37, verse 3, and Zedekiah the king sent Jehukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maasiah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. In 2005 to 2008, there was excavations done in the city of David. A small bullet was found that's like a seal that's made out of clay that you press someone's official name or stamp on documents and other things. It was found to say, Jehukal, son of Shelemiah, son of Shoevi. And this dates to 587 and 586 BC. Now let's go on to Menahem, king of Israel. 
in the Bible, we have 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 17 through 19. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, son of Gadi, became king over Israel and reigned 10 years in Samaria. This is dating to 754 to 737 BC. If you look to your left, you can see the Assyrian inscription in Kala Annals in the walls of Tiglath Pileser's palace, in which it states, I received tribute of Kastapai, the Kumuhite, Rezin, the Damascusian, Menahem, the Sumerian, Hiram, the Tyrian. Continuing, on your right side, you can see the Iranian stele, which is also known as the Royal Monument of Tiglath Pileser, in which it states, the kings of the land of Hatti, land of Aram of the western seashores, the land of Kidar, Rezin, the Damascian, Menahem, the Sumerian, Tuba'il, the Tyrian, I imposed on them tribute of silver, gold, tin, and iron. Here we have the archaeological evidence to support Menahem, the biblical character. Now let's continue on with Nebu Sarsakim, chief staff of the king of Nebuchadnezzar. In the Bible, we have Jeremiah 39, verse 3. Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. I didn't list all of them because it's really hard to pronounce their names, but the one we have is Sarsakim right there in gold. And then it goes on to say, with the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. If you look to your left, you will see the clay tablet BM114789 and the British Museum is where it is stored. And it is a clay cuneiform and it dates to 605 to 562 BC in which it states 1.5 minas of gold the property of Nabu Sarsakim, the chief eunuch, which he sent via Arad Ban Etu, the eunuch, to the temple Asanglia in the presence of Belusat, son of Aplaya, the royal bodyguard, and of Nadin, son of Marduk Zer Ibni. Month 4, day 18, year 10 of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Here we have Sarsakim being proven to be a true character. Now let's continue on with Sambalat, governor of Samaria. In the Bible, we have Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, verse 19, chapter 4, verse 1. And seven and eight, chapter six, one through five, and verses 12 through 14. And we also have chapter 13, 28. I'm not going to read all of these, but they all mention Sambalat, governor of Samaria. And this is dating to 407 BC. If you look to the upper left corner, you will see the papyrus of Elephantine, in which it states in those letters. We have also set the whole matter forth in a letter in our name to Deliah and Shelemiah, the son of Senbalat, the governor of Samaria. Continuing on with physical evidence of Senbalat, the governor of Samaria, we have Bola WD-22, and that is on your bottom left corner, in which you can see some of the inscription is still there in which it states a seal that Sanballat used. And it states, Sanballat, the governor of Samaria. Further evidence that Sanballat, the person mentioned in the Bible, is a real and true character. 
Now let's go on to Tatanai, governor of across the river. In the Bible, we have Ezra chapter 5, verse 3 through 4, in which it states, At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar, Bozni, and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, Who has commanded you to build this temple? And finish this wall. Then accordingly, we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. This is in the time of Darius, in which we were rebuilding the temple. If you look to your left, you will see an example of these tablets. There are 70 tablets housed in the museums at Yale, Harvard, Berlin, in Germany, and London in England. They contain transactions under Darius I in 502 BC. This particular tablet is VAS 14152. It's a Persian tablet written in cuneiform, in which it states, Tatan, governor across the river. This is hard evidence proving that Tatanai, that's mentioned in the Bible, is a true and real character. Now let's continue on with Jehaka, king of Cush and Pharaoh of Egypt. In the Bible, we have 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. And the king, king of Syria, heard concerning Jehaka, king of Cush, Look, he has come out to make war with you. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah. If you look to the far left, you can see a stele, and this dates to 671 BC. This stele is the Zinjirle stele, and it describes Sarhadon's campaign, in which it states, As for Terhaka, king of Egypt, and Cush, cursed of their great godhood, I am inflicted a great defeat upon him from Ishupri to Memphis, his royal city. If you also look to the left, you can see the Rassam cylinder from Ashur Banipal's campaign mentions, which mentions Terhaka eight times. And one of them, it states, in my first campaign, I marched to Makan and Melua, Terhaka, king of Egypt and Cush, whom Asarhadan, king of Assyria, my father, my begetter, had defeated and ruled his land. He, Terhaka, forgot the might of the god Asher and trusted in his own strength. Here we have two physical sources outside the Bible, which proves Terhaka, the person mentioned in the Bible, is a true and real character. Now let's continue on with Annas, also known as Ananus, father-in-law of Caiaphas. In the Bible, we have John 18, verse 13. First, they led him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Also, we have in the Bible, Acts 4, verse 5 through 6, the next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. This is two places in the Bible. It's mentioning Annas. Annas, also called Ananus, was high priest in 6 AD and continued in that role until 15 AD. If you look to your left, you will see a picture of Josephus. Josephus records in Jewish Antiquities 18.26, Quinarius, the Roman procurator, had now liquidated the estate of Archelaus, since the high priest Joser had been overpowered by a popular faction. Quinarius stripped him of the dignity of the office and installed 
Ananus, the son of Seth, as high priest. Here we have written record outside the Bible that Ananus is high priest, making him a true and real character. Now let's go on to Areta, the fourth king of Nabatea, that is Petra. You can see Petra on the top left corner. You can also see a coin below it, which is a coin that was minted under Areta the fourth. In the Bible, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32 through 33, in which it states, In Damascus, a ruler under King Aretas guard the city of Damascus in order to arrest me. And this is talking about Paul. So I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. King Aretas ruled the Nabataean kingdom from 9 BC until 40 AD. We have Josephus who wrote in the Jewish Antiquities 16.294, in which it states, the rule of the Arabs was taken by Arenas, whose name was later changed to Aretas. This is talking about the Nabataeans. Josephus refers to them as Arabs. Also in the Jewish Antiquities, 18.109 and 110, it also states, in the meantime, a quarrel whose origin I shall relate arose between Aretas, king of Petra, and Herod. The tetrarch Herod had taken the daughter of Aretas as his wife and had now been married to her for a long time, falling in love with Herodias. He lated that he must oust the daughter of Aretas. So we have some backstabbing and some wheeling and dealing going on. But we have two places in the Jewish antiquities written by Josephus that proves Aretas is a real and true character mentioned in the Bible. Next, we have Candace, queen of Ethiopia. And you can see her on the left. In the Bible, we have Acts 8, verse 27. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. The Ethiopian queen, also known as the Queen of Cush, was mentioned many times by the Greeks and the Roman writers. Historian and geographer Strabo writes in Geography 17.54, in which he states, but Petronus, setting out with less than 10,000 infantry and 800 cavalry, forced them, the Ethiopians, to flee, was ruler of the Ethiopians in my time. After this, he was set out for Napta. This was the royal residence of Candace. In the Roman historian Pliny, he writes in Natural Histories, 6.186 through 187, in which he states, the actual town of Moreau, they said, is at a distance of 70 miles from the first approach to the island. They said that it is ruled by a woman, Candace, a name that has passed through a succession of queens for many years. Here we have two of many historical records proving that Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, is a real and true character. Next we have Drusilla, the Jewish wife of Felix and the sister of Herod Agrippa. You can see in the bottom left we have Drusilla's brother, Herod Agrippa I. This is his coin that was minted during his time. In the Bible we have Acts 24 verse 24. Several days later when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Christ Jesus, or in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. Paul was arrested in Jerusalem 
and was tried in a hearing. The charges were dismissed, and the Roman procurator, Felix, and Drusilla came to visit Paul. Drusilla was born 37 to 38 AD and was the younger sister of Bernice and Agrippa II, the daughter of Herod, Agrippa I, and the granddaughter of Aristobulus. She divorced Azizus and married Felix, which was recorded. Josephus writes in the Jewish Antiquities 2.141 through 144, in which he states, not long after Drusilla's marriage to Azizus was dissolved under the impact of following circumstances at the time when Felix was procurator of Judea, he beheld her and insomuch as she surpassed all the other women in beauty, he conceived a passion for the lady. Felix promised to make her supremely happy if she did not disdain him. She, being unhappy and wishing to escape the malice of her sister Bernice, for Drusilla was exceedingly abused by her because of her beauty. She was persuaded to transgress the ancestral laws and to marry Felix. By him, she, Drusilla, gave birth to a son whom she named Agrippa. How this youth and his wife disappeared at the time of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the time of Titus Caesar. The Roman governor. Felix is also recorded in Acts 24 and in the Jewish Antiquities 2 160. Here we have written record of Drusilla and Felix, proving that their names mentioned in the Bible make them a true and real character. Now let's continue on with the Rastus, the official in Corinth. In the Bible, we have Romans 16, verse 23, Gaiastus, who is host to me and to the whole congregation, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greets you. Erastus was the city treasurer in Corinth. If you look to your left, you can see a street carving. In 1929, while excavating a paved street near a theater, it was discovered a street inscription containing the name Erastus. Written in Latin and dated to the late first century, the inscription states, Erastus, in return for his idolship, laid the pavement at his own expense. Idolship is a Latin word that means public city official. Here we have concrete proof of Erastus mentioned by Paul in the book of Romans. Now let's continue on with Herodias, wife of Herod Philip and Herod Antipas. And we're also going to look at John the Baptist. Mark chapter 6 verse 17 describes Herod Antipas when he orders the head of John the Baptist after Herodias daughter dances. Herodias first married Herod Philip, divorced Philip to marry Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was her half-brother. Matthew, Mark, and Luke account this story. Josephus, Flavius Josephus, writes in Jewish Antiquities 18, 136 to 137. They had a daughter named Salome, after whose birth was Herodias, taking it into her head to flout the way of our fathers, married Herod, her husband's brother, by the same father who was the tetrarch of Galilee, i.e., Herod Antipas. 
To do this, she parted from a living husband. Now let's look at John the Baptist. Concerning John the Baptist, Josephus writes in the Jewish Antiquities 18, 116 to 117. But to some of the Jews, the destruction of Herod's army seemed to be divine vengeance, and certainly a just vengeance. For his treatment of John, surnamed the Baptist, for Herod had put him to death, though he was a good man. Here is two places where Josephus is recording Herodias and John the Baptist, showing that they were indeed historical, true, and real characters. Now let's look at Gallio, Lucius, Junius, Gallio, Ennius, proconsul of Achaia. In the Bible, we have Acts 18, verse 1 and verse 12. Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. Roman author Seneca and Roman historian Dio Cassius mentions the first century Gallio. Gallio was proconsul over South Central Greece, Athens, Corinth, and Delphi. If you look to your left, you'll see an inscription. This inscription was from Caesar Claudius and was discovered in the city of Delphi. On it, it states, for a long time, we have been not only well disposed toward the city of Delphi, but also solicitous for its prosperity. But now, since it is said to be destitute of citizens, as L. Junius Gallio, my friend and proconsul, recently reported to me, I order you to invite well born people also from other cities to Delphi as new inhabitants. Here we have carved in the stones in Delphi, proof of the biblical person mentioned. This picture on the left is a picture of Masada. This is one of my favorite places to go to. If you ever find yourself in Israel, you must go see Masada. You will also see Gomorrah at the feet of Masada, and you also see the Dead Sea, as you can see it in the background of this picture. One of the things that happened at Masada around 70 AD, a group of people led by Judas the Galilean were on the run from the Romans, and they held up at the top of this fortress mountain. In the Bible, we have Judas the Galilean being described in Acts chapter 5 verse 34 through 37. It describes an uprising against the Romans due to a census and was led by a man named Judas the Galilean. This is from 66 to 70 AD. Josephus writes in Jewish Antiquities 18, Quinarius also visited Judea, which had been annexed to Syria, in order to make an assessment of the property of the Jews and to liquidate the estate of Archelaus. Although the Jews were at first dissented, but a certain Judas threw himself into a cause of a rebellion. In this case, certainly, Judas started among us an intrusive fourth school of philosophy. Josephus goes on, as for the fourth of these philosophies, Judas the Galilean set himself up as a leader of it, they have a passion for liberty that is almost unconquerable. They think little of submitting to death and permitting vengeance to fall on kinsmen and friends. With these two references to Judas the Galilean, we also have archaeological evidence of the Roman military surrounding Masada and also dismantling a mountain to build a ramp to get up to the top of the mountain to kill Judas, the Galileans' people. This in all took a whole entire year of the Roman military forcing Jews from other cities to come and build this ramp, only to find that the moment that the Romans finally made it up to the mountain, they had all committed suicide. The only way we know that this story is recorded is because there were two 
a woman and a child that survived by hiding in a cistern. They later told Josephus what had happened. Now let's go on to Matthew. No, that is not Matthew in the left-hand corner, but I will get to this person in a bit. Before I go on to the Gospel of Matthew, I must plug this book. There is a book called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. It was written by David Bibbon and Roy Blizzard Jr. Listeners out there to check out this book. It's an amazing book. It breaks down the Hebrew idioms and the Hebrew undertones under the Greek manuscripts in which they make the case that there has to be Hebrew manuscripts out there. This book was written in the 1980s and Roy Blizzard said people need to go out and look for Hebrew manuscripts of Matthew and the Gospels because the evidence is overwhelming that the Gospels were originally written in Hebrew and not in Greek as the professors in colleges here in the West suggest. If you translate the Greek back into Hebrew, you get poems, you get rhyming schemes, you get Hebrew idioms that only exist in Hebrew. Now let's look at some further proof of this fact and also proof of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, now in the left-hand corner, you're looking at the church father Papias who lived in Turkey and was once a student under John. In 95 to 110 AD, Papias stated, Matthew collected the oracles in the Hebrew language and each interpreted them as best as he could. There we have in 95 AD, we have Matthew being declared as a person and also the person who is collecting all the stories to create the gospel, Matthew. Further in history, we also have Jerome in 392 AD. Matthew composed a gospel of Christ at first published in Judea in Hebrew. The Hebrew itself has been preserved until the present day in the library at Caesarea. I have also had the opportunity of having the volume described to me by the Nazarenes and the Baroia who use it. So up until 392, we have people still using Hebrew Gospels. And in fact, this is very important because nobody was actually looking for them. And with the Spanish Inquisition and the Roman Catholic Church hunting down Hebrew Gospels and burning them, it's a surprise that we actually found some. We have now found Hebrew Gospels in Catalonia. In Spain, we have also found Hebrew Matthew Gospels all over the place. In fact, we have found 28 Shem Tov's Hebrew Gospel, Matthew. There have also been some found at the Vatican Library when they digitized all of their manuscripts. And that concludes my teaching for Lesser Known Biblical Archaeology Part 4. I want to thank everybody for making it this far. And going through all this evidence, there is so much archaeology out there. Every day they're finding new things that prove the Bible is true and correct. And there's nothing like this on the planet. Other religions don't have this. They don't have records. They don't have archaeological evidence to support the things that they are saying. But the Bible does. And so it is very sad to see when people in academia have their hands on all this evidence and they hide it from the public. So that is what we are doing here at Project Truthbeam. We are revealing and shining light on the archaeological evidence, the truth in the Bible. And so what I ask is that you please share this out. Here are some of my sources, of course, the Bible and a Christian's Guide to Evidence for the Bible, the British Library, and there are some other sources that were in there particularly Josephus, Jewish Antiquities. I just want to say thank you to everyone out there. I hope this has been a blessing. God bless you and keep searching out for the truth.